Welcome back. Remember last time we talked about the Exodus and how possibly, just possibly, Ramses might be the pharaoh of the Exodus. He's the greatest king of the 19th dynasty. But after his reign, Egypt sort of starts to slide and go downhill. And I want to talk about that slide, but I'd like to also talk about, I don't want to leave you without telling you about Ramses' mummy. It's a great story. I want to tell you about the mummy of Ramses the Great, because it maybe gives us a clue as to why Egypt started its long slide. Um, the mummy was found in the famous cache of royal mummies at Deir al-Bahri that we talked about, that the, when the priest kings had gathered together mummies for safety because there were robberies in the Valley of the Kings, Ramses was one of those mummies that was put away in a secret tomb and remained undisturbed for 3,000 years. Now, the mummy tells a great story. Uh, first, after the mummy was discovered, it was brought to Cairo to be placed into a museum. Right? And it's now in the Egyptian Museum. You can actually see the mummy of Ramses the Great. It may be the only face you ever look on of a biblical fi figure. Right? I mean, think about it. How many actual faces from the Bible can you see? But Ramses' mummy remained in the Egyptian Museum for about a century almost, untouched practically. And that was the problem. The mummy was viewed as a dead person rather than a museum object, so there was no conservation done on it. And in the humid atmosphere of Cairo, it was starting to grow fungi, right? And it was starting to decay. You could actually see 19th century photos of Ramses and 20th century photos of Ramses, and you could see the decay. So something had to be done. Now, the mummy of Ramses the Great is the only pharaoh's mummy ever to leave Egypt. Right? It was decided that Ramses had to be refurbished, saved. So the mummy was flown to France. It was going to be worked on at the Museum of Man by a team of scientists to see what they could do about stopping the fungi, reversing the damage, and fixing Ramses. Uh, interesting story, by the way. Um, how do you get the mummy of a king through customs? What do you label him as? Um, he, he, when, he, when he touched down, when the plane touched down in, in Paris, he was given the full treatment of a head of state, of a visiting head of state. Right? The band was there because he was a, a king of Egypt. So he was given the full treatment, Ramses, um, and taken to the museum. And then the study began. Uh, they had to be very gentle with Ramses. I mean, you know, it, it is a 3,000-year-old mummy. And so gentle, for example, he was flown in, his, in the coffin that he had been in. It was, it was a modern coffin that they made for him on display. But they didn't want to lift him up, even. So they cut the end of the coffin and slid him out rather than, rather than lifting it. They were just, just afraid to really do almost anything to him. So they studied him. And they found 89 different species of fungi on Ramses. Right? And they had to kill these fungi. The problem is, of course, how do you do that without damaging the mummy itself? You can't heat it. You might normally try to heat it. You can't even freeze it because it would contract and perhaps that would cause damage. What do you do? They finally hit on a, a solution that has been used in operating rooms for years. Gamma ray sterilization. You very often, by the way, surgical tools are gamma ray irradiated. That's how you sterilize them. You nuke them, basically. And they're perfectly sterile. And this doesn't cause changes. It has that, that great advantage. So they, they nuked Ramses, they, they, they irradiated him with gamma rays. But before they did that, they took pieces of unimportant mummies and tested it to see if there was any change in the color of the skin, for example. They even used some parchment as a, as a test. Um, so Ramses was irradiated, and that was, that was good. That worked just fine. Uh, in the future, by the way, there may be a problem with that, just maybe. This was before anybody ever thought about doing DNA studies on mummies. And we don't know what gamma ray irradiation has done to the DNA of Ramses the Great, whether we'll be able to recover it now in future studies. But um, at least the fungi were killed and Ramses was sterile. Now, how do you keep Ramses sterile? Well, the Getty Museum helped here. Now, remember, the Getty Museum are the ones that restored the tomb of Nefertari. Ramses' wife. So it's kind of nice that they had a part in restoring Ramses the Great. Um, they designed a case. They wanted a case that was simple, very simple, that you could keep them low maintenance, that could be maintained in Cairo quite easily. And they came upon the solution of nitrogen. Let me explain. When air, when the components of air was first discovered, remember the old chemistry in Lavoisier and 
the French figuring out what the parts of air was, they called nitrogen azote. Now, the French word azote really comes, it means without life, azote, without life. And they called nitrogen azote because when they did experiments and put little animals like mice in nitrogen, they died because there's no oxygen. So nothing could live in an atmosphere of nitrogen. So they designed a case, the Getty designed a case with an atmosphere of nitrogen in it. And Ramses were put inside that case so that now nothing is going to grow in that case. He's virtually sterile. The shipment, by the way, back was really quite interesting because they didn't want to open, you didn't want to open the case and then let things in. You, you want nitrogen. And they shipped the case in a kind of almost like these bubbles that you put um, children without immune systems in. And they had tools and everything so it was to install Ramses in his coffin in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. So he's there and he's, um, as we say, dead and well. Uh, the mummy's, mummy has been refurbished, rewrapped. Um, it's doing fine. But let me tell you about what we learn about Ramses from the mummy itself. It's a different picture from what you get when you read the temple inscriptions that Ramses left us. You know, there's a tendency to think always of Ramses as this youthful guy riding off into battle. He's got all these wives. He's got, you know, a hundred kids. Um, everything is fine on the Nile. Ramses died a cripple, probably. Now, remember, he ruled for 67 years. He is probably about 88 years old when he dies. That's quite an age in Egypt. Um, he is the second longest reigning monarch for Egypt. Think back to the Old Kingdom. Remember the end of the Old Kingdom? The Old Kingdom ended with Pepi II, a pharaoh who reigned for 94 years, the longest reigning monarch in the history of the world, ruled for 94 years. He was a child, of course, when he took over. But remember we talked about that that may have been the reason why Egypt went downhill. The pharaoh was supposed to be the physical leader of the country. He wasn't like the prime minister or the president. He had to physically lead the army. So maybe Egypt went downhill under Pepi II because he couldn't maintain the army anymore. He wasn't looking after business. The same thing may have happened with Ramses. You know, in his late 80s when he dies, he certainly didn't ride out anymore. Um, maybe he couldn't even take care of business. So possibly the age of Ramses may even contribute to this decline that we're going to see today in the 19th dynasty. But there's some other great things about the mummy of Ramses. I mean, he's, um, one thing, for example, we know he suffered from arterial sclerosis, right? X-rays of Ramses can show that the arteries are clogged, the femoral arteries, as a matter of fact, are, are clogged. Um, he also had a terrible infection in the mandible. Terrible. Massive. He may have even died from it. Remember, the Egyptians had no way of treating infection. They had no germ theory. They had no idea of what was causing this. And Ramsey's mandible shows a tremendous infection. It was common for Egyptians to suffer tooth decay, but not because of our common, you know, our, our causes like sugar. No, they didn't have a lot of sugar in their diet. The wealthy maybe had honey. What caused the decay was their bread. Commoners and kings ate the same kind of bread, basically. It was stone ground. And as the bread was stone ground, you get a little bit of the stone in your, in your grain. Not only that, if you've got a desert country, sand's blowing into it. So when you bake your bread, it's got quite a bit of grit in it. And as you chew it, you're literally sanding down your teeth. Almost all the mummies I examine even young ones have teeth that are worn down from chewing this bread. Now what that does is it exposes the pulp of the tooth and that's when you get your decay. So it's not because of sugars or honey or whatever, it's because of these ground down teeth and that may have really ultimately done in Ramses the Great. There's another, there's a real interesting feature to Ramses, I mean I love the mummy of Ramses the Great, it's a great mummy. Um, the, the first really neat thing is the heart's on the wrong place, right? Um, I don't mean that figuratively, you know, that, that Ramses had his heart in the wrong place, he was a bad guy. It's in the wrong place. It's on the wrong side of the body. Um, let me explain. <laughs> At mummification, the heart was left in the body. Because, as you know, the Egyptians believed you thought with your heart, so when you're resurrected, you'd need it to think, say the magical spells, etc. So the heart was left in the body. Now, when Ramses was x-rayed, it looks as if 
Ramsey's heart, I mean, there's no question about it, the heart is on the wrong side of the body. But it looks as if the heart is sewn into place with perhaps gold thread. Right? Now, the only thing I can think of that could have caused that is maybe when the embalmers working on the mummy of the king remove the internal organs, take out the stomach, liver, intestines, kidneys, go in through the diaphragm into the thoracic, right? You have two cavity, abdom abdominal below the thoracic. Go into the thoracic. They're taking out the lungs, and perhaps they damage the heart. Perhaps they cut it. And perhaps, just perhaps, the heart falls out by mistake. Well, then they've got to put it back in. And this would have been a really difficult thing, suturing up Ramses in internally with gold thread. Now, you'd use gold thread because gold never tarnishes. That's the medal of eternity. Even the the tomb of a pharaoh was called the gold room. So you would use gold thread because it would last forever. So it seems as if the mummy of Ramses may have had some really interesting repairs on it in ancient times even. Um, another interesting feature of my man Ramses is that he was a redhead. Um, we can tell that from analysis of his hair. It's not that, you know, as you get older, of course, your hair changes color. But Ramses really had natural red hair. Now, this may have a religious significance religious. Remember, Ramsey's father was Seti I, and Seti was an unusual name because it showed an allegiance with the god Set, not one of the dominant gods. Well, the followers of Set were always said to have red hair, right? And maybe Ramsey's whole family was this redheads that somehow had this following for the god Set, and that's why they were sort of associated with Set. It's an interesting thing, but he was redheaded. Um, but Ramsey's today, lies in the Egyptian museum, in the mummy room, and you can see him today. The pharaoh who went out to Cush and did battle, who married, the, he's there. It's real history. Um, but as I say, perhaps Ramses' range is too long, because Egypt is going to slip during the 19th dynasty. And that's what I want to talk about now, the slipping, the slow, slow decline. Now, remember, Ramses had all these sons, probably 52 of them, I think, is the number that's about used now. Well, naturally, many of them are going to predecease him. They're going to die before Ramses. Ramses was proud of his kids. On the wall at Luxor Temple, for example, you can see a procession of his children. The sons are lined up, and they've got their names under them, you know. Right on the front, you can see Amun Herkepchef, the firstborn. You count a few more down, you'll see Chaim Wasit, that archaeologist kid who did the, did the excavations. And then, if you count down 13, you'll see Menepta, the thir 13th son who becomes king of Egypt. And what that means is, of course, that the first 12 died before Ramses. Right? So we get this 13th son, Merneptah, being king of Egypt. Now, don't think of him as a kid. He's probably 60 years old by the time he ascends to the throne. His name is nice. It means, it means the beloved of Ptah. Mer is the word for love and beloved, Mer. And the end means of and Ptah, the god Ptah. So he's the beloved of Ptah. It's a nice name. And he's the one who erects the famous victory stella. The, in the fifth year of his reign, he erects that round top stone, talking about his victories in the area of Canaan. And he's the one who says, Israel is destroyed, its seed is no longer. And for a long time, many people said that Merneptah is the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Just because he is the first one to mention Israel. But remember what I said last time. It is clear from this inscription that he is not talking about the Exodus. He is talking about defeating a group of diff different countries and peoples outside the borders of Egypt. So Merneptah is not the Pharaoh of the Exodus. I'm really quite sure of it. Now, he does do battle, of course. I mean, he has this victory style, and he says he loves to beat up people. I mean, he likes that. Um, he talks about fighting the Libyans. Now, the Libyans are to the west, and they will become a threat later. And as a matter of fact, in a couple hundred years, you're going to see Libyans ruling Egypt. But now they're not any, any real power, not a real force to be reckoned with. But remember, to get from Libya to Egypt, to invade Egypt, is a big deal. You're going across a desert, and you can get lost. So it was a big deal to fight the Libyans. And he fights the Libyans, and he defeats them. And on Karnak, 
temple wall, on a wall at Karnak Temple, he talks about this defeat. And there's an amazing inscription. Um, I'm one of the few people who brings his students to see this inscription. Many of the Egyptian guides, they're, they're very, you know, genteel and they don't want to show it. Um, let me explain it. I'll tell you what it says first. Right? It, it says, the uncircumcised penises of 6,359 Libyans killed were carried off. Now, what does that mean? Right? The ancient Egyptians, in a battle, had army scribes guys whose job it was to keep track of how many you kill, how many you capture, all that. Now, a battle, of course, takes place on a large field. And imagine it. There's confusion. You have hand-to-hand -hand battle. It's not at a distance. And at the end of the battle, Egypt, of course, has won, right? And you've got this field that's strewn with bodies. How do you count the number? It's not easy. I mean, one scribe walking all over the field, one, two, three, or do you have five scribes calling and you hope they don't, don't count the same guy? Well, to make it easier, the tradition in Egypt was to cut off a hand. They would hack off a hand, bring it to a central place on the battlefield, pile them up, and the scribes would count the hands. That's how you kept track of how many you had killed. Now, sometimes, if you wanted a big display of your valor and victory, you bring the hands back. You can bring the hands back, and you've got this you know, cartloads of hands. I mean, rather gruesome. But that was the idea. You know, you're going to show, I'm powerful, I'm brutal, don't mess with me. Now, somebody may have said, we don't know exactly why the penises are cut off in this particular battle. Somebody may have said, if you bring back the hands, how do we know these aren't the hands of women? How do we know they're the hands of men? Reneptai answered that question. He brought back the penises, right? And th notice, the inscription says uncircumcised. That's a kind of derogatory thing. The Egyptians considered themselves superior. They were circumcised. The Egyptians practiced circumcision. It was done when a boy reached puberty, not at, not at, not at birth. Um, and this was a real sign of being Egyptian. And even, you know, last time we were talking about the Exodus, where did the Jews get the idea of circumcision? It could have been from the Egyptians. Right? So, Merneptah is proud of this battle with the Libyan where he brings back penises, uncircumcised ones. Right? He also builds, um, he has a palace that he builds in the Delta area at Memphis, the capital of Egypt. But it's, it's gone, it's terribly damaged. And the reason is the Delta. The Delta was a marshy area. Right? Memphis is not in the delta, but it's near enough that the water table is high. So the palace is sunk underground, and all we have are a few blocks now. But uh, it was undoubtedly a great palace. He was a builder like his father, Ramses the Great. His tomb is interesting also. Um, it, Howard Carter, the discoverer of Tutankhamun's tomb, made an interesting discovery right outside Merneptah's tomb, in a pit he found 13 large alabaster jars. By large, I mean they're probably two feet high, maybe three feet high. And technically, they're not alabaster, by the way. It's calcite. Egypt, Egypt doesn't have true alabaster. It looks pretty good to me, and when it's sold to tourists, it's always called, called alabaster, but it's really calcite. But these are large jars, and they were used in the mummification of Merneptah before they put the body in the tomb. Um, and they were considered sacred because they were part of the mummification, so they were buried near the tomb. Right? Interesting discovery. 1920, Howard Carter did that. Um, but the tomb is interesting. Um, Merneptah was buried in a fantastic sarcophagus. Fantastic. It was actually three nested sarcophagi, one inside the other. Really quite an impressive thing. I mean, they were massive, massive things to protect the body forever. And on his tomb walls was the Book of Gates. It's a magical text that's going to enable the pharaoh to get to the next world. On the journey to the next world, you're going to have to th go through gates. Think about it. An Egyptian temple, you always had to go through a pylon, a gateway. And the idea was, the next world is going to be the same, and it's going, to be, it's going to be pretty impressive. Not only that, though, there's going to be people who want to keep you out of the gates. They'll be gatekeepers. And you had to know the names of the gatekeepers and what was going to happen. It was the secret words, right? And on the walls of the tomb of, of Merneptah, we have the Book of the Gates. So his tomb is, in a sense, 
not only going to protect the body of Merneptah, it's going to help him get to the next world. Right? Now, after Merneptah, after the death of Merneptah, we have a strange, strange decline. It's, it's a curious period in the dynasty. Why? Well, let's think of what's happened. Ramses the Great ruled for 67 years. 67 years. Maybe too long. Maybe he can't really lead the army. Maybe the army isn't maintained. But now we get his son. Ah, but his son is 60 years old when he gets on the throne, right? So we've got this problem of older pharaohs, and Egypt almost always goes downhill when the pharaoh lives too long, right? So what happens after Meneptah? We get a mystery king, Amun Messus, rules for about two years. Now, why do I call him a mystery king? He wasn't supposed to be king. Now, as you know, he became king by marrying the right woman, the heiress, the woman who had the pure royal blood flowing through her veins. It was matriarchal, right? Matrilineal, and sometimes a queen could even rule, and it becomes matriarchal. And you'll see, that happens at the end of this dynasty. So we get Amun Messus, who is not the king's eldest son, who is usually the one who marries this right woman, right? He's a son of Merneptah, but he's not supposed to be king. And all of a sudden, boom, he's king, right? He has a tomb in the Valley of the Kings, so there's no doubt he was ruling as king, but we don't know much about him. He succeeded by Seti II, probably his brother. Now, what does Seti II do? The first thing he does is erase Amun Messus's name wherever he finds it. Now, why would a king do that? Well, there are some reasons. One theory, and it's just a theory, is that Seti II is the king he was supposed to be king. He's the prince who was supposed to be king. And that maybe Amun Messus somehow you know, pushed him aside or something like that. But it's clear he doesn't like him. So he erases his name. Now, this was common in Egypt, by the way. Pharaohs erasing the names of predecessors. Common. It was, it's an interesting practice. They did it for two reasons. One was when you really wanted to erase all traces of anyone. He would See, the Egyptians didn't have a concept of heaven and hell. They just had heaven, the next world. The worst thing that could happen to you is if you went out of existence. Right? There was no place where you went for eternal torment. No. You went out of existence. That was the worst. Even, for example, in the Book of the Dead, when you're being judged to see if you're worthy. If you're not worthy of going to the next world, they just take your heart out and throw it to this creature who's a devourer of hearts, and you go out of existence. So one reason was, if you hated your predecessor, for some reason, you would erase his name wherever it existed. And to erase the name, you erased him. He no longer existed. That's what happened, remember, at the end of Tutankhamun's reign, when you had the her heretic pharaoh, his father, Akhenaten, and everybody associated with that was annihilated from the records. Right? So I think that's probably why Seti does this. The other reason why you might erase another pharaoh's name and replace it with yours is you wanted to take credit for his monument. Ramses the Great was called the Great Chiseler. Why? Because he erased everybody else's name. Not because he hated them. He wanted to take credit for all the monuments. So, for example, we get statues that were 100 years old during Ramses' time with his name on it. He would take a statue, carve out the previous pharaoh's name, and put his. And the idea was kind of like when the gods looked down, they would see this statue, and they would see it has Ramses' name, and they would credit Ramses. You know, they could look down and look at the statue, but they wouldn't look down and see that Ramses was coughing out somebody else's name, you know? It's, it's, it's an interesting concept, but that's why people did this all the time in Egypt. It makes it very difficult for Egyptologists. Just because you find a statue with somebody's name on it doesn't mean it's of him. Very often we know it's not. So Seti comes in, eradicates probably his brother's name. Now, Seti had three queens. Two of them are going to be important for us. We're coming to the end of the dynasty. Right, we're coming to the end. There's only going to be two more rulers. But he has three queens of whom two are important. Now remember, please, 
that there were three relationships a woman could have with regard to the pharaoh. Great wife, that was only one at any one time. She was the honcho of the harem. Then there was queens, right, who were kind of married. They were a wife married to the, or you could be a concubine, right? So three relationships. So he has three queens, three wives, so to speak, right? Now one is Tia, right? She is going to be the mother of the next king. Right? And another one, Tauseret, is going to actually rule Egypt. Right? So Seti's got some interesting women around him. Interesting. But he builds his own monuments. Seti built a chapel at Karnak. And let me tell you about this chapel. Karnak Temple was the largest religious building in the history of the world. Huge. For thousands of years, each pharaoh went to this place and added his own temple. Don't think of it as one temple. It doesn't make any sense, the, 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 the plan. You can get lost in Karnak Temple because it's Ramses buildings, Seti's buildings, Seti II's buildings, right? Everybody added. This was sacred ground. This was the Vatican of Egypt. And Seti II goes to Karnak Temple and he builds a special monument, a boat chapel. Now, let me explain what a boat chapel was. Remember in Thebes that the chief gods were Amun, Mut, and Hansu. Egyptian gods always came in trinities. Amun is the hidden one, Mut is his wife, and Hansu is their child. Well, at Karnak Temple, statues of these gods were kept. But on festival times, and these statues were never seen by the commoners, kept in the back of the temple in the Holy of Holies. But at festival times, the statues were placed on portable shrines in the shape of a boat. These are pretty big boats. I mean, it's like about 20 feet long. And the boat shrine rested on poles, two poles. And during festivals, the priests, shaven-headed priests, 10 on each side sometimes, would carry these poles on their shoulders. And they would parade the statues of the gods in front of the people. And for the first time in a long time, people could see the statues of their gods. It was a big deal. Now, Seti II builds a boat chapel. It has, it's a small temple. By small, it's probably 40 feet across maybe. But it has three compartments. One for the boat of Amun, one for the boat of Mut, one for the boat of Khonsu. So during festivals, the statues would be placed in the shrine, the boats would be taken out of the shrine and paraded for the people to see. Right? So that is his monument that we know he built at Karnak Temple. Then he dies. Right? Then he dies. And he is succeeded by his son, Sipta, who is the son of one of his wives, Tia. Sipta is an interesting mummy. We have his mummy. He's another one of those that was found in that royal cache. The foot is deformed, probably from polio. Many people think that Sipta had polio, and the foot is deformed. And I think it's interesting that a pharaoh of Egypt could have a deformity. I mean, he became king of Egypt, no questioning about it. You know, Sipta's king of Egypt with a deformed foot. Could he lead the army? Well, from a chariot, perhaps. Right? But it also may be a sign that Egypt is weakening, that they're, they're going to accept a, a pharaoh with a defect, with a birth defect, or, or a def defect of any kind. But Sipta becomes king of Egypt. Doesn't reign long, maybe five years, something like that. And then it happens, the thing I mentioned. His stepmother, Tauseret, becomes ruler of Egypt. We don't know why. She is on the throne. We do not know why. Only two years. She even had a small tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Right? So she was definitely ruling. There was a separate little tomb for her jewelry. Quite interesting. They found silver gloves. Silver gloves. I don't mean the color. Silver gloves. And in it, were eight finger rings, beautiful finger rings. Right? So she had her jewelry hidden in a cache for eternity. 
But the 19th dynasty ends in this very strange way, with a woman ruling Egypt. Next time we'll see the consequences of what happens when a woman rules Egypt. I'll see you then.